Section 22 of The Interpretation of Dreams. This is LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Hall. The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud. Translated by A. A. Brill. Section 22. I once had occasion to make a thorough study of a young girl who was passing through various psychic states. In the state of frenzied confusion with which her illness began, the patient manifested a quite peculiar aversion for her mother. She struck her and abused her whenever she approached the bed, while at the same period she was affectionate and submissive to a much older sister. Then there followed a lucid but rather apathetic condition with badly disturbed sleep. It was in this phase that I began to treat her and to analyse her dreams. An enormous number of these dealt, in a more or less veiled fashion, with the death of the girl's mother. Now she was present at the funeral of an old woman, now she saw herself and her sister sitting at a table dressed in mourning. The meaning of the dreams could not be doubted. During her progressive improvement hysterical phobias made their appearance the most distressing of which was the fear that something had happened to her mother. Wherever she might be at the time, she had then to hurry home in order to convince herself that her mother was still alive. Now this case, considered in conjunction with the rest of my experience, was very instructive. It showed, in polyglot translations, as it were, the different ways in which the psychic apparatus reacts to the same exciting idea. In the state of confusion which I regard as an overthrow of a second psychic instance by the first instance, at other times suppressed, the unconscious enmity towards the mother gained the upper hand, and found physical expression. Then, when the patient became calmer, the insurrection was suppressed, and the domination of the censorship restored, and this enmity had access only to the realms of dreams, in which it realised the wish that the mother might die, and, after the normal condition had still further strengthened, it created the excessive concern for the mother as a hysterical counter-reaction and defensive phenomenon. In the light of these considerations, it is no longer inexplicable why hysterical girls are so often extravagantly attached to their mothers. On another occasion, I had an opportunity of obtaining a profound insight into the unconscious psychic life of a young man for whom an obsession or neurosis made life almost unendurable, so that he could not go into the streets because he was tormented by the fear that he would kill everyone he met. He spent his days in contriving evidence of an alibi in case he should be accused of any murder that might have been committed in the city. It goes without saying that this man was as moral as he was highly cultured. The analysis, which, by the way, led to a cure, revealed, as the basis of this distressing obsession, murderous impulses in respect of his rather over-strict father, impulses which, to his astonishment, had consciously expressed themselves when he was seven years old, but which, of course, had originated in a much earlier period of his childhood. After the painful illness and death of his father, when the young man was in his thirty-first year, the obsessive reproach made its appearance, which transferred itself to strangers in the form of this phobia. Anyone capable of wishing to push his own father from a mountain top into an abyss cannot be trusted to spare the lives of persons less closely related to him. He therefore does well to lock himself into his room. According to my already extensive experience, Parents play a leading part in the infantile psychology of all persons who subsequently become psychoneurotics. Falling in love with one parent and hating the other forms part of the permanent stock of the psychic impulses which arise in early childhood and are of such importance as the material of the subsequent neurosis. But I do not believe that psychoneurotics are to be sharply distinguished in this respect from other persons who remain normal. That is, I do not believe that they are capable of creating something absolutely new and peculiar to themselves. It is far more probable, and this is confirmed by incidental observations of normal children, 
that in their amorous or hostile attitude towards their parents, psychoneurotics do no more than reveal to us by magnification, something that occurs less markedly and intensively in the minds of the majority of children. Antiquity has furnished us with legendary matter which corroborates this belief, and the profound and universal validity of the old legends is explicable only by an equally universal validity of the above-mentioned hypothesis of infantile psychology. I am referring to the legend of King Oedipus and the Oedipus Rex of Sophocles. Oedipus, the son of Laius, king of Thebes and Jocasta, is exposed as a suckling because an oracle had informed the father that his son, who was still unborn, would be his murderer. He is rescued and grows up as a king's son at a foreign court, until, being uncertain of his origin, he too consults the oracle and is warned to avoid his native place, for he is destined to become the murderer of his father and the husband of his mother. On the road leading away from his supposed home, he meets King Laius, and in a sudden quarrel strikes him dead. He comes to Thebes, where he solves the riddle of the Sphinx, who is barring the way to the city, whereupon he is elected king by the grateful Thebans, and is rewarded with the hand of Jocasta. He reigns for many years in peace and honour, and begets two sons and two daughters upon his unknown mother, until at last a plague breaks out, which causes the Thebians to consult the oracle anew. Here Sophocles' tragedy begins. The messengers bring the reply that the plague will stop as soon as the murderer of Laius is driven from the country, but where is he? Where shall he be found? Faint and hard to be known, the trace of the ancient guilt? The action of the play consists simply in the disclosure, approached step by step and artistically delayed, and comparable to the work of a psychoanalysis, that Oedipus himself is the murderer of Laius, and that he is the son of the murdered man and Jocasta. Shocked by the abominable crime which he has unwittingly committed, Oedipus blinds himself and departs from his native city. The prophecy of the oracle has been fulfilled. The Oedipus Rex is a tragedy of fate. Its tragic effect depends on the conflict between the all-powerful will of the gods and the vain efforts of human beings threatened with disaster. Resignation to the divine will and the perception of one's own impotence is the lesson which the deeply moved spectator is supposed to learn from the tragedy. Modern authors have therefore sought to achieve a similar tragic effect by expressing the same conflict in stories of their own invention. But the playgoers have looked on unmoved at the unavailing efforts of guiltless men to avert the fulfilment of course or oracle. The modern tragedies of destiny have failed in their effect. If the Oedipus Rex is capable of moving a modern reader or playgoer no less powerfully than it moved the contemporary Greeks, the only possible explanation is that the effect of the Greek tragedy does not depend upon the conflict between fate and human will, but upon the peculiar nature of the material by which this conflict is revealed. There must be a voice within us which is prepared to acknowledge the compelling power of fate in the Oedipus, while we are able to condemn the situations occurring in Di Onfra, or other tragedies of fate as arbitrary inventions. And there actually is a motive in the story of King Oedipus which explains the verdict of this inner voice. His fate moves us only because it might have been our own, because the oracle laid upon us before our birth the very curse which rested upon him. It may be that we were all destined to direct our first sexual impulses towards our mothers, and our first impulses of hatred and violence toward our fathers. Our dreams convince us that we were. King Oedipus, who slew his father Laius and wedded his mother Jocasta, is nothing more or less than a wish fulfilment, the fulfilment of the wish of our childhood. But we, more fortunate than he, in so far as we have not become psychoneurotics, 
have since our childhood succeeded in withdrawing our sexual impulses from our mothers and in forgetting our jealousy of our fathers. We recoil from the person for whom this primitive wish of our childhood has been fulfilled with all the force of the repression which these wishes have undergone in our minds since childhood. As the poet brings the guilt of Oedipus to light by his investigation, he forces us to become aware of our own inner selves, in which the same impulses are still extant, even though they are suppressed. The antithesis with which the chorus departs. Behold, this is Oedipus, who unravelled the great riddle and was first in power, whose fortune of the townsmen praised and envied. See in what dreaded adversity he sank. This admonition touches us and our own pride, we who, since the years of our childhood, have grown so wise and so powerful in our own estimation. Like Oedipus, we live in ignorance of the desires that offend morality, the desires that nature has forced upon us, and after their unveiling, we may well prefer to avert our gaze from the scenes of our childhood. In the very text of Sophocles' tragedy, there is an unmistakable reference to the fact that the Oedipus legend had its source in dream material of immemorial antiquity, the content of which was the painful disturbance of the child's relations to its parents, caused by the first impulses of sexuality. Jocasta comforts Oedipus, who is not yet enlightened, but is troubled by the recollection of the oracle, by an allusion to a dream which is often dreamed, though it cannot, in her opinion, mean anything. For many a man hath seen himself in dreams his mother's mate, but he who gives no heed to such matters bears the easier life. The dream of having sexual intercourse with one's mother was as common then as it is today with many people, who tell it with indignation and astonishment. As may well be imagined, it is the key to the tragedy and the complement to the dream of the death of the father. The Oedipus fable is the reaction of fantasy to these two typical dreams, and just as such a dream, when occurring to an adult, is experienced with feelings of aversion, so the content of the fable must include terror and self-chastisement. The form which it subsequently assumed was the result of an uncomprehending secondary elaboration of the material, which sought to make it serve a theological intention. Another of the great poetic tragedies, Shakespeare's Hamlet, is rooted in the same soil as Oedipus Rex. But the whole difference in the psychic life of the two, widely separated periods of civilization, and the progress, during the course of time, of repression in the emotional life of humanity, is manifested in the differing treatment of the same material. In Oedipus Rex, the basic wish fantasy of the child is brought to light and realised as it is in dreams. In Hamlet it remains repressed, and we learn of its existence, as we discover the relevant facts in a neurosis, only through the inhibitory effects which proceed from it. In the more modern drama, the curious fact that it is possible to remain in complete uncertainty as to the character of the hero has proved to be quite consistent with the overpowering effect of the tragedy. The play is based upon Hamlet's hesitation in accomplishing the task of revenge assigned to him. The text does not give the cause or the motive of this hesitation, nor have the manifold attempts at interpretation succeeded in doing so. According to the still prevailing conception, a conception for which Goethe was first responsible, Hamlet represents the type of man whose active energy is paralysed by excessive intellectual activity. Sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought. According to another conception, the poet has endeavoured to portray a morbid, irresolute character on the verge of neurasthenia. The plot of the drama, however, shows us that Hamlet is by no means intended to appear as a character wholly incapable of action. On two separate occasions we see him assert himself, once in a sudden outburst of rage, when he stabs the eavesdropper behind the arras, 
and on the other occasion when he deliberately and even craftily with the complete unscrupulousness of a prince of the renaissance sends the two courtiers to death which was intended for himself what is it then that inhibits him in accomplishing the task which his father's ghost has laid upon him here the explanation offers itself that it is the peculiar nature of this task hamlet is able to do anything but take vengeance upon the man who did away with his father and has taken his father's place with his mother the man who shows him in realization the repressed desires of his own childhood the loathing which should have driven him to revenge is thus replaced by self-reproach by conscientious scruples which tell him that he himself is no better than the murderer whom he is required to punish i have here translated into consciousness what had to remain unconscious in the mind of the hero if any one wishes to call hamlet an hysterical subject i cannot but admit that this is the deduction to be drawn from my interpretation the sexual aversion which hamlet expresses in conversation with ophelia is perfectly consistent with this deduction the same sexual aversion which during the first few years was increasingly to take possession of the poet's soul until it found its supreme utterance in timon of athens it can of course be only the poet's own psychology with which we are confronted in hamlet and in a work on shakespeare by george brandis eighteen ninety six i find the statement that the drama was composed immediately after the death of shakespeare's father sixteen o one that is to say when he was still mourning his loss and during a revival as we may fairly assume of his own childish feelings in respect of his father it is known too that shakespeare's son who died in childhood bore the name of hamnet identical with hamlet just as hamlet treats of the relation of the son to his parents so macbeth which was written about the same period is based upon the theme of childlessness just as all neurotic symptoms like dreams themselves are capable of hyperinterpretation and even require such hyperinterpretation before they become perfectly intelligible so every genuine poetical creation must have proceeded from more than one motive more than one impulse in the mind of the poet and must admit of more than one interpretation i have here attempted to interpret only the deeper stratum of impulses in the mind of the creative poet with regard to typical dreams of the death of relatives i must add a few words upon their significance from the point of view of the theory of dreams in general these dreams show us the occurrence of a very unusual state of things they show us that the dream thought created by the repressed wish completely escapes the censorship and is transferred to the dream without alteration special conditions must obtain in order to make this possible the following two factors favour the production of these dreams first this is the last wish that we could credit ourselves with harbouring we believe such a wish would never occur to us even in a dream the dream censorship is therefore unprepared for this monstrosity just as the laws of solon did not foresee the necessity of establishing a penalty for patricide secondly the repressed and unsuspected wish is in this special case frequently met halfway by a residue from the day's experience in the form of some concern for the life of the beloved person this anxiety cannot enter into the dream otherwise than by taking advantage of the corresponding wish but the wish is able to mask itself behind the concern which has been aroused during the day if one is inclined to think that all this is really a much simpler process and to imagine that one merely continues during the night and in one's dream what was begun during the day one removes the dreams of the death of those dear to us out of all connection with the general explanation of dreams and a problem that may very well be solved remains a problem needlessly it is instructive to trace the relation of these dreams to anxiety dreams in dreams of the death of those dear to us the repressed wish has found a way of avoiding the censorship 
and the distortion for which the censorship is responsible. An invariable concomitant phenomenon, then, is that painful emotions are felt in the dream. Similarly, an anxiety dream occurs only when the censorship is entirely or partially overpowered. And, on the other hand, the overpowering of the censorship is facilitated when the actual sensation of anxiety is already present from somatic sources. It thus becomes obvious for what purpose the censorship performs its office and practices dream distortion. It does so in order to prevent the development of anxiety or other forms of painful effect. I have spoken in the foregoing sections of the egoism of the child psyche, and I now emphasise this peculiarity in order to suggest a connection. For dreams too have retained this characteristic. All dreams are absolutely egoistical. In every dream the beloved ego appears, even though in a disguised form. The wishes that are realised in dreams are invariably the wishes of this ego. It is only a deceptive appearance if interest in another person is believed to have evoked a dream. I will now analyse a few examples which appear to contradict this assertion. 1. A boy not yet four years of age relates the following dream. He saw a large garnished dish on which was a large joint of roast meat, and the joint was suddenly, not carved but eaten up. He did not see the person who ate it. As we know, the neurotic also is inclined to immoderation and excess. Who can he be, this strange person, of whose luxurious repast the little fellow dreams? The experience of the day must supply the answer. For some days past, the boy, in accordance with the doctor's orders, had been living on a milk diet. But on the evening of the dream day, he had been naughty and, as a punishment, had been deprived of his supper. He had already undergone one such hunger cure, and had borne his deprivation bravely. He knew that he would get nothing, but he did not even allude to the fact that he was hungry. Training was beginning to produce its effect. This is demonstrated even by the dream, which reveals the beginnings of dream distortion. There is no doubt that he himself is the person whose desires are directed toward this abundant meal, and a meal of roast meat at that. But since he knows that this is forbidden him, he does not dare, as hungry children do in dreams, to sit down to the meal himself. The person remains anonymous. Number two. One night I dream that I see on a bookseller's counter a new volume of one of those collector's series, which I am in the habit of buying. Monographs on artistic subjects, history, famous artistic centres, etc. The new collection is entitled Famous Orators, or Orations, and the first number bears the name of Dr. Letcher. On analysis it seems to me improbable that the fame of Dr. Letcher the long-winded speaker of the German opposition, should occupy my thoughts while I am dreaming. The fact is that a few days ago I undertook the psychological treatment of some new patients and am now forced to talk for 10 to 12 hours a day. Thus I myself am a long-winded speaker. Number three. On another occasion I dream that a university lecturer of my acquaintance says to me, my son, the myopic, then follows a dialogue of brief observation and replies. A third portion of the dream follows, in which I and my sons appear, and so far as the latent dream content is concerned, the father, the son and Professor M are merely lay figures, representing myself and my eldest son. Later on I shall examine this dream again, on account of another peculiarity. Number four. The following dream gives an example of really base egoistical feelings which conceal themselves behind an affectionate concern. My friend Otto looks ill. His face is brown and his eyes protrude. Otto is my family physician, to whom I owe a debt greater than I can ever hope to repay, since he has watched for years over the health of my children, has treated them successfully when they have been ill, and, moreover, has given them presents whenever he could find any excuse for doing so. 
He paid us a visit on the day of the dream, and my wife noticed that he looked tired and exhausted. At night I dream of him, and my dream attributes to him certain of the symptoms of Bastow's disease. If you were to disregard my rules for dream interpretation, you would understand this dream to mean that I am concerned about the health of my friend, and that this concern is realised in the dream. It would thus constitute a contradiction, not only of the assertion that a dream is a wish fulfilment, but also of the assertion that it is acceptable only to egoistical impulses. But will those who thus interpret my dream explain why I should fear that Otto has Bastow's disease, for which diagnosis his appearance does not afford the slightest justification? My analysis, on the other hand, furnishes the following material, deriving from an incident which had occurred six years earlier. We were driving, a small party of us, including Professor R., in the dark through the forest of N., which lies at a distance of some hours from where we were staying in the country. The driver, who was not quite sober, overthrew us and the carriage down a bank, and it was only by good fortune that we all escaped unhurt. But we were forced to spend the night at the nearest inn, where the news of our mishap aroused great sympathy. A certain gentleman who showed unmistakable symptoms of morbus base dowie, the brownish colour of the skin of the face and the protruding eyes, but no goiter, placed himself entirely at our disposal and asked what he could do for us. Professor R. answered in his decisive way, nothing except lend me a nightshirt, whereupon our generous friend replied, I am sorry, but I cannot do that, and left us. In continuing the analysis, it occurs to me that Bastow is the name not only of a physician, but also of a famous pedagogue. Now that I am wide awake, I do not feel quite sure of this fact. My friend Otto is the person whom I have asked to take charge of the physical education of my children, especially during the age of puberty, hence the nightshirt, in case anything should happen to me. By seeing Otto in my dream with the morbid symptoms of our above-mentioned generous helper, I clearly mean to say, if anything happens to me, he will do just as little for my children as Baron L did for us, in spite of his amiable offers. The egoistical flavour of this dream should now be obvious enough. But where is the wish-fulfilment to be found in this? Not in the vengeance wreaked on my friend Otto, who seems to be fated to be badly treated in my dreams but in the following circumstance. Inasmuch as in my dream I represented Otto as Baronel, I likewise identified myself with another person, namely with Professor R, for I have asked something of Otto, just as R asked something of Baronel at the time of the incident I have described. And this is the point, for Professor R has gone his way independently, outside academic circles, just as I myself have done and has only in his later years received the title which he had earned before. Once more, then, I want to be a professor. The very phrase in his later years is a wish fulfilment, for it means that I shall live long enough to steer my boys through the age of puberty myself. End of section 22. Recording by Tony Hall, Cumbria.